Okay, watch this. When pressing this button right here, this monitor switches modes from the regular 4K 240Hz mode into a 1080p mode with double the refresh rate. It now clocks at 480Hz. When I first heard about this feature, I thought this was probably a bit of a gimmick. Like, does it really make sense to run 1080p on a monitor like this? And is 480Hz even worth the trade-off? I mean, this is not a small monitor. It's a 31.5 inch panel, so 1080p seems a bit low. And 480Hz, yeah sure, that's gonna be pretty sweet on an older panel like this, but the default 240Hz isn't too shabby either. So I was a bit unsure if the 480Hz mode was just a marketing gimmick or something that actually brings value. But yeah, after actually using this monitor for some time now, I have to say that I enjoy the 1080p 480Hz mode a lot more than I thought I would. Of course, not for every game. Sometimes you just want the resolution, other times the higher refresh rate makes more sense. In some games like Valorant for instance, I'm still a bit on the fence and I'm still switching between the 240 and the 480Hz modes quite a bit. We'll get to the reason behind that in a minute, but dual mode definitely is not just a gimmick. And of course, there's a lot more to this monitor than just the dual mode. Like this is one of the most high-end monitors you can buy right now. We're gonna talk about the response times, HDR and all the good stuff, but I wanna talk about the dual mode first, because that's what sets this monitor apart from every other monitor on the market. Okay, this dual mode feature actually has three different sub-modes. You can either choose to have 1080p stretched across the full screen, or have the display emulate a smaller monitor. This is the 24-inch mode, which of course is surrounded by thick black bars. The other option is for a 27-inch picture size with slightly smaller bars respectively. In either mode, the monitor acts like a 1080p monitor, but obviously the pixel mapping is different in all three modes. Physically, this still is a dense 4K panel, so it has to somehow map the lower resolution to this panel, which has an impact on the image quality. We'll have a close look at the sharpness differences between all these modes in a minute, but either way, the motion clarity of the 480Hz modes is just insane. You can already see a bit of the sharpness differences here between these modes due to the pixel mapping, so these test UFOs don't look exactly identical across these modes, but no matter the mode, the motion clarity is just crazy. I mean, 240Hz already looks great, especially on an older panel, but side by side the boost in motion clarity is very obvious. This level of motion sharpness is something we've previously only could achieve with backlight strobing. And yet the Zoe XL2566K with DIAC enabled is still a bit sharper even, but the strobing is causing a lot of artifacts and other issues, so I'd say 480Hz OLED looks quite a bit better. Part of that comes down to the fast response times. Even at 480Hz, the response times are fast enough to keep up with a super high refresh rate. Now, technically, we're only getting about 93% refresh rate compliance here at 480Hz thanks to these two outliers. I don't want to get into too much detail, but these are not caused by slow pixel transitions, but by small brightness adjustments that the panel makes on the fly. Like, yeah. Technically, this is a 5.1 millisecond transition, but in practice, it's basically a 0.9 millisecond transition plus a 4.2 millisecond brightness adjustment. Anyway, bottom line is that this is not really something response times related, and thus it's fair to call this monitor 100% refresh rate compliant at 480 Hz, which is quite an achievement. But I feel it's easy to lose context when looking at all these numbers, so for some perspective, this is what your standard, but good, 165Hz IPS monitor looks like in comparison. I guess it's pretty easy to see that this is a massive jump. Though if you're already using or planning to get a 360Hz QD OLED, the difference is pretty subtle. It's kinda hard to notice, honestly. And that raises the question of whether or not the jump from 240Hz to 480Hz is even worth it. I mean, the difference in smoothness and motion clarity is noticeable, especially when switching directly between the 240 and 480Hz mode, but we also have to consider the loss in quality when going from 4K to 1080p. And whether or not that's a worthy trade-off really depends on the game. For slower-paced, story-driven games, the choice is pretty clear. But even in slightly faster-paced, sim-racing games like ACC, I don't think you really need that high of a refresh rate. And I kinda prefer the eye candy at 4K with high settings. With HDR turned on and almost 200 FPS on my 4080, this is great. The gameplay really is smooth and responsive enough, and I much prefer this over the lower res 480Hz mode. In games like Fortnite though, eye candy is not really a concern, and visibility is not a problem. Most fights are pretty close quarters, so you don't need a lot of pixels to see the head of your opponents clearly. It's not like you're often firing shots from far away at like 
pixel sized heads, so 1080p really is enough here. But it's a pretty fast paced game, so 480Hz is a huge benefit. And at 1080p the frame rate is also a lot higher as Fortnite usually is GPU limited. And that also helps a lot with the experience. I definitely prefer the 480Hz mode here. Now in Valorant though, I'm still switching modes a lot. I mean 480Hz is great, sure, but it's a tactical shooter that's much slower paced than something like Fortnite or Overwatch. So the benefit of a high refresh rate is a bit smaller here. That's not to say 480Hz doesn't feel great in Valorant, but I'm not sure if the benefit is big enough to play at 1080p. At 4K you can really see every little detail. At 1080p heads become basically just a rectangle at a certain distance. Not something that's much more difficult to hit, but this is just with the bot at a 30 meter distance. It's not uncommon to have fights over much longer distances, where the character models basically become just a heap of pixels at 1080p, and at 4K you can still see every little detail. I'm not saying 4K is in any way necessary for Valorant, that's really not the case, but we're talking about a 240Hz display already in its 4K mode, so you're not really missing out on much. And it's also pretty easy to get north of 5-600fps at 4K in this game, so yeah, it's not like 480Hz and 100fps more would make for a wildly different experience in Valorant. Just like 4K, it's just a small little advantage, and I'm personally not sure if I prefer the refresh rate advantage over the visibility advantage or the other way around. Really both 480Hz 1080p and 240Hz 4K have something to it in Valorant. When it comes to the three different 480Hz modes though, I have a pretty strong preference for the full wide mode. That's the mode that stretches the 1080p image across the whole screen. So four physical pixels work together to display a single digital pixel, which is good because this is an even pixel mapping that doesn't need any fancy interpolation. In comparison, the 24 inch and 27 inch modes just have a much worse image quality. That's because of the uneven pixel mapping in these modes. 1080p with a 1 to 1 pixel mapping would just make for a 15.7 inch image size on this panel, so there is some interpolation going on to stretch this to a 24 inch and 27 inch image size, which ultimately makes the image look worse. I'd say the 24 inch mode looks ever so slightly better than the 27 inch mode, but the image looks rather soft in both modes. I'd love to see these modes with a 1 to 1 pixel mapping, but that would be roughly equivalent to 1650p for 24 inch and 1850p for 27 inch, which probably are a bit too many pixels to handle at 480Hz for now. So yeah, I'd rather use the full wide mode and move the monitor slightly back. This monitor at 79cm away covers the same field of view as a 27 inch monitor at a 68cm distance, or a 24 inch monitor at a 60cm distance. It's really not a big deal to push the monitor a few centimeters back when engaging the dual mode. I'm not really used to playing that far away from the monitor, but when you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense to use a larger monitor at a distance over a smaller monitor up close. It frees up the space in front of the monitor for a larger mouse pad, but the screen still covers the same FOV as getting up close and personal with a 27 inch monitor for instance. So I much prefer the full wide mode over the 24 and 27 inch modes. Now lag could also be a concern given there's some kind of interpolation going on. It can take some time to calculate where to put which pixel when using a non-native resolution. And yeah, in its regular mode, the 32G S95 UE has a processing lag of just 0.4 milliseconds, but it takes 0.2 milliseconds longer than the 480Hz modes. But thanks to the higher refresh rate, in total these modes have even less lag than the 240Hz mode. So the additional processing lag is an absolute non-issue. With only 1.6 milliseconds, it actually shares the top spot with the XL2566K and that's the lowest display lag I've measured so far on any monitor. Really doesn't matter if a monitor is like a millisecond faster or slower, but it's always nice to see when a monitor is fast. I guess it's pretty clear that this is one of the best and most versatile monitors right now when it comes to high refresh rate gaming, but low refresh rate and variable refresh rate gaming can still be a bit of a challenge for OLED monitors, as nearly all OLED monitors flicker with adaptive sync. And yeah, this one occasionally flickers too when adaptive sync is on, but only under certain conditions. Most of the time adaptive sync actually works fine, which is quite an achievement for an OLED. In game the adaptive sync experience is almost flawless, only menus and loading screens occasionally flicker a bit. I'm not sure what LG did different this time, but this is the first OLED monitor that I would actually use with FreeSync or G-Sync, so that's a welcomed improvement. LG also worked on the color fringing issue, which was one of the most critiqued problems on the first gen OLED. 
This panel uses a new RGWB layout, which is much closer to the traditional RGB stripe than what the previous generation of WOLED panels use. And this new panel also has a much higher pixel density, which also helps a lot. So text and graphics basically look flawless now. With the old pixel layout on the right, there's this green and red fringing issue that's pretty visible on the yellow folder icons in the file explorer, for instance. And that's completely gone with the new RGWB layout. That being said, yellow still isn't the favorite color of this panel. Highlighted text looks still a bit softer than text on a white or a gray background. Generally, sharpness-wise, this panel is not quite on the level of a traditional LCD with a similar resolution. Text looks slightly softer, not quite as sharp and crisp as you would expect from a 4K panel. But overall, text still looks great and leaks better than on a 1440p OLED. I've been using this monitor a lot for writing scripts and editing, and yeah, this really is a nice monitor to use for all kinds of productivity tasks. At least if we disregard the burn-in risk. LG explicitly told me that their 2U warranty covers burn-in, which of course is nice to hear. But yeah, it's still a bit risky to buy an OLED monitor for heavy productivity use if you want to use it beyond the warranty. That aside, I really like this monitor for video and photo editing, and it's also great for working with text. This is also one of the brightest OLED monitors currently on the market, and it's flat with a matte coating, so it's actually pretty decent in a bright room. I certainly had to use my window blinds a lot less with this monitor than with a glossy, curved QD OLED. Full screen, it can put out a bit more than 270 nits, which definitely helps battling the ambient light. And in its default setting, which is peak brightness off, there's basically no automatic brightness limiting, so the brightness is pretty consistent. In a pinch, you can even squeeze out a bit more peak brightness with the peak brightness low or high setting. This boosts the brightness quite a bit for low APLs. Effectively, this makes most games a good bit brighter, which helps a lot with gaming during the day. Still, OLED is not the go-to panel tech for bright rooms, and that hasn't changed yet. I mean, this monitor comes close to some entry-level to mid-tier LCD monitors in terms of brightness, and from all the OLED monitors I've tested so far, this is the best for daytime use. But yeah, a decent LCD for less than half the price does a better job with the sunlight. But daytime use is not really what these OLED monitors are all about. At night or in a dimmed room, this panel just looks amazing, especially with HDR content. I mean, at this point, I probably don't have to reiterate how amazing blacks look on an OLED panel. That hasn't changed from the previous generations, but the HDR peak brightness actually has increased quite a bit, which makes the contrast pop even more. And that's most visible with small specular highlights. 1367 nits is actually the highest I've measured on an OLED so far. Granted, that's only for a 1% window, but that's super impressive nevertheless. Now, I have the results for the HDR accuracy linked down below if you want to have a closer look. And I also have the SDR color measurements and the recommended settings there as well. That's a public post over at my Patreon that includes all the in-depth data for your monitor nerds out there. You don't have to be a patron to see this, it's a totally free and public post. But of course, I'm always happy if you want to support what I'm doing. Anyway, a quick high-level summary of the color accuracy. It's acceptable. I wish it was a lot better, given that this is such an expensive monitor, but yeah, after changing some settings, you can at least get it to be decently color accurate. And you can always calibrate it, and it even supports hard calibration, which of course is nice to see. But a better factory setup really wouldn't hurt for such a high-end product. Now, on a positive note, this monitor actually has some decent speakers. That's not something I usually mention in a video about a monitor. But yeah, LG put their pixel sound tech into this monitor, and I have to say it's probably the best sounding monitor I've tested so far. Pixel sound essentially uses the whole panel as a speaker, and that's the same tech LG use on their TVs as well. Here's a little sound test. Not bad for a monitor, honestly. And it's great to see that some of the tech we've been seeing in TVs for quite some time now finally found its way into monitors. So yeah, I like this monitor a lot. Dual mode actually is a much more useful feature than I thought it would be, and I hope we see more of that in the future. Like a 27-inch mode with a one-to-one -one pixel mapping really would be amazing. But even in its current state, having the choice between 4K at 240Hz and 1080p at 480Hz is a great addition. And 480Hz really is something else on a fast OLED panel. But this really makes me curious about the upcoming 480Hz 1440p OLED panel. I hope we see that soon. Anyway, thanks for watching. Man sieht sich im nächsten Video.